So I too will say good morning and Shabbat Shalom. Today is um, Groundhog Day, if you didn't know. <laughs> and, and if you looked at the report, it said that the groundhog did not see his shadow. So that means that we're in for supposedly an early spring. <laughs> and apparently he hasn't, this hasn't happened very many times. He definitely sees his shadow more often than, than, than he doesn't. So, so anyway, but, but when I looked at that and it said that there was um, an early spring, in my spirit I just felt like, like the Lord was, was making a proclamation, not only over me, but over us, because I was just in prayer for us um, this morning, of the seeds that are being planted, the seeds that have been planted, the seeds that will be planted in our lives, are going to produce an early harvest. We're going to start to see those shoots and that indication of life early. That there's things that are happening in an accelerated manner. And so I just felt like the Lord wanted me to just release that, you know, over us as a congregation and, and to look for those, those signs of where, you know, life, you know, is being produced in your own life, in, in each other. Because I think we're going to see them and we're going to see them in areas more quickly than we had anticipated or thought. So I'm planting a seed of expectation of the goodness of the Lord and, and what he's going to do. And in part I want to share, if you have questions or have a point, please feel free to, to raise your hand. Um, in part this is just going to be somewhat of a testimony of just how the Lord continues to work in my life and the things that he is teaching me from um, experiences that I've gone through. And so I want to start with probably a scripture that isn't one of our favorites, but I want to focus on a part that hopefully you can consider to become a part of your favorite. But this is James 1, 2. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Now, who right there when we read that, you just kind of go, Ugh. is that how you respond? <laughs> okay. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete needing nothing. And this is the part that I really want us to consider today. And I hope that I can bring out through, through just examples, you know, that we will be perfect and complete needing nothing. And then I want to pair that with 2 Corinthians 1, 4. It says, He comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort others when they are troubled we will be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. Part of the, or one of the things that I would say in the last few years that the Lord has been, been teaching me, training me in, and largely this is in my aspect of, of intercession and that, but you know, who does the Father want to be for me? now, in this situation, in this circumstance, or as, as a prayer request comes to me, you know, that's a question that I'm asking, you know, okay, you know, Father, who do you want to be for these individuals, you know, in, in this situation? And how do, if it's, you know, me, how do you want me to see this situation? Or part of my prayer for other people, maybe, you know, how do you want them to see the situation, because I'm learning that um, that the Father isn't doing things to us. He is doing things for us, because he's always trying to get something in us, and there's something that needs to get out of us. 
And I know when we were going through our experience with Brinley, um, early on, one of the things that I felt like the Lord was saying to me is, you know, Mary, I don't want you to miss my fingerprint. And if you know, you know, when you put a fingerprint on a windshield, I mean, there's a place where, you know, you can be looking right at it and not see it, depending on how the light hits it, you know, and there again, depending on where you're standing or your perspective, you can see different aspects or different fullnesses of that, that fingerprint. So having gone through what, what my family experienced with Brinley, I mean, you went through that experience, but it's something that I continue to, to chew on because here again, I believe that there's aspects of his fingerprint that he's still revealing to me. And it was interesting, Johnny and I were talking at the supper table last night, and I was just reminded um, of, of a situation that I'd like to just kind of start with. So the morning when um, Brinley started acting up, and at first the way she was manifesting, it was almost like maybe she was having some colic. You know, when you held her up against you, she was bringing up her knees kind of like her stomach was hurting. So anybody that's held an infant, that, that squirm that they have, that like, you know, they either have a gas bubble or their stomach is hurting, that's the way she began to first manifest. And so then as, as the day progressed, you know, I've shared before, you know, that, that I left for, for just a short period of time. And while I was away, Mark had called me and he says, he goes, well, I think we need to call the pediatrician and I think we need to take her in. You know, am I just being that first time parent, you know, that's freaking out, you know, and I just assured him, if you feel like you need to call the pediatrician, call the pediatrician. They have abundant grace for first time parents. <laughs> But when I walked back in the house, like I said, it was a short time. It may have been a little more than an hour, but it hadn't been a long period of time. You know, and when I left, her color was still good. I mean, there was not any issues with her breathing or anything. When I stepped back into that house, I just, you know, had stepped in. I had shut the door. And the fear that was in that house was palatable to me. The hair was standing up on my arms. There was this gray cast over Brinley. And I felt death knocking at the door. I didn't know that that's what it was necessarily at first in, in that moment. But there was an atmosphere that was in the house that, I mean, I just set foot in the house. And it, to me, it was palatable. And I heard the Lord say, Mary, you can partner with fear or you can remain in my love. And in that moment, I mean, it was fast. I go, I choose to remain in your love. And part of me was going, okay, if this grandma starts freaking out, this poor mom and dad are absolutely going to lose it. So there was that place where I go, I need to remain in a place of peace in order to walk through this with my daughter and my son-in-law. And so I go, Lord, I choose to remain in your love. And then as we went to the doctor and, and here again, you know, as you just saw person after person and the care and the concern that was on them and trying this and looking at this and just not knowing what was going on. There again, I just, you know, under my breath, you know, as you're praying in the spirit, I just kept saying, you know, Lord, I choose to remain in your love. I choose to remain in your love, and your perfect love casts out fear. I'm not going to partner with fear. I'm not going to bring myself into agreement with fear. While there is reason to be concerned, which was evident, I'm not going to partner with fear. And here again, part of the journey, as, as I had prayed for Mark and Laura, even clear back into 2015 when they were desiring a child, um, the transition between asking and then giving thanks. So, you know, a transition point where, where the father had just said, you know, okay, you've been asking. Now I just want you to give me thanks for what you have received. And then when we found out that Laura was pregnant, 
largely the Lord really had me um, pray out of and make declarations out of Psalm 139 of just, you know, this child being fearfully and wonderfully made, being, you know, knit together in, in her mother's womb, and all of her days being written in his book. So there again, when we came to the moment where her life was being threatened, there were promises that I believe that the Lord had given me along the way. That there again, I knew that she was fearfully and wonderfully made. I knew that she was being knit together in her mother's womb. That all of her days were written in his book before she had yet lived one of them. And here again, to me, these were evidences of the way the Lord was revealing his goodness to me. Because when it was determined there was something with her heart and she needed to be life flighted, there again, I mean, that was the question, you know, that the Lord posed to me. You know, Mary, your testimony has been that I'm a good father. Yeah, and that's easy when everything's going good. But what is your testimony going to be in this situation? And if I choose to take Brinley home, will I still be a good father? And as I said before, I mean, I, I, I had to pause. That, that response wasn't, wasn't as immediate as remaining in his perfect love. You know, that question of his goodness in light of what we were facing, you know, I paused. And, you know, there's, you know, all kinds of things that are going through, through your mind. And here again, one of those things that promise in Psalm 139 of all of our days being written in his book before there was one. There again, that was one that was just being shouted out, you know, within my spirit. And I knew that all of her days were written in his book. And so I'm going, could all of her days just be nine? And for me, that was the wrestling. You know, is that a good father? Are, are just nine days good? But I, I did. I came to the point where it's like, yes. If it's just nine days, he's still good, and I will celebrate those nine days should that be all that we get. And then as we were at Primary Children's on the morning of, of August 30th, um, there again, so much of this was happening at night, and so the rest of our children... Um, you know, hadn't got word of that there was anything yet that was going on because we were still finding out and we didn't know what to say yet. And so when we got to Primary Children's, for whatever reason, Laura took this little Snapchat and she sent it around to the family. Well, Latham was on his way. He was up in Logan his first year. He was on his way to his English class, first day of English, and he, and he saw this picture. And so he calls me up. And he goes, Mom, where are you? He goes, Laura just sent a snap. And he said, it looked like you were in a hospital. <laughs> and here again, at this point, you know, it had been over 24 hours, you know, since we had slept, eaten, you know. And I go, we are. And he says, well, where? And I go, well, we're at Primary Children's. And he's like, in Salt Lake? You know, in his response, he goes, Mom, I just saw Brinley this weekend. She was fine, you know, and so it was like, you know, oh, here we are, you know, everything's roses. And he goes, you know, and so he says, is she going to be okay? And there again, in that moment, we didn't know. We didn't know. And I just go, Latham, right now, we don't know. You know, and he was like, but mom, <laughs> and so here again, you know, how, 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 we, how we comfort others, because here again, it's like, okay, Lord, you know, help me to receive your comfort, because I also have children that need the comfort of a mama, and so how do I give them that comfort, and in that moment, you know, the Lord was, was showing me this, this picture of you know, standing in, in a circle, and inside this circle was peace, but then the concentric circles, you know, that are, that are going out. And so we were in the middle 
of, of this trauma and things were unfolding and maybe our peace had been reduced to just this very small circle. But here again, he was showing us, he was showing me, you know, the territory of peace that was available um, to me. And to me, this is where I think the scripture in, in Isaiah 9, you know, where the Messiah is being revealed as the Prince of Peace. And it goes on to say, you know, how the increase of his government or his government and his peace will never end. And so it was just speaking to me in my spirit of how peace is a ruling power. And I can be in an uncertain moment. You can be in an uncertain moment. We can be in the middle of chaos, but we can also be right in the center of peace. And then we can walk out and we can have more peace, even in our, our uncertainty and our unknowing. And for me, that's an area where I think the Lord has really you know, had to work with me because, I mean, I'm a person that likes control. I like certainty. I like structure. I like routine. <laughs> and, and so being in those, <laughs> so being in those places of uncertainty definitely, definitely makes me feel very insecure. So there again, teaching me that I can be insecure. I can be secure when I feel insecure, just because of, of, who, of who he is. And so being in just in that place of peace, so I, I, I hung up the phone from Latham and, you know, for a minute, because I had gone to the wall. And I think, you know, when sometimes when you're in those traumatic things, you know, things just do, they seem surreal. It seems like time is going slow. And I just remember just kind of, you know, sliding down the wall. <laughs> And, you know, and I just had to rest my head, you know, on my knees for a minute and, and just take a breath. I mean, I think we've all been in those situations and it's like, you know, can the world just stop? You know, please, I would just like to, you know, get off and I'd like to just stop for a moment. And so there again, so not only was the Lord showing me, you know, Mary, you could remain in my perfect love, which is going to chase away the fear, but you can also remain in my peace in the uncertainties and in the un unknowing. The enemy loves to use our disappointments to cause us to doubt the goodness of God. And here again, I, I could see that because a question that we hear asked a lot in our world today is, you know, if he's a good God, then why do bad things happen? Why do natural disasters happen? You know, why is there poverty? And, and here again, going through this, I mean, the Lord was, I can remember the morning when Brinley was having her surgery and they had kind of a balcony area on, on the roof where you could overlook the valley. And as I was just pondering his goodness, he was saying, you know, Mary, don't let the attributes of the enemy, which are to steal, to kill, to destroy, to devour, be assigned to me. You need to know me, my nature, and my character so that when somebody wants to assign that I'm stealing, I'm devouring, I'm killing, that that isn't who I am, and you can declare who I am. And so to just, you know, to pause in that and to just stay in that place of, so yeah, we're in the middle of a situation that people would say is bad. But there again, to be able to give testimony to his goodness. There was a hospitality worker who worked in the CICU. 
and I believe he was there every day that we were in the CICU except for one. And the first couple of days when he came by, he would come in. He had immigrated from Ethiopia. And he would come and he'd go, it is good? You know, and we would give him the report of what we knew. Well, the third day that, that he came by and he did that, you know, he paused and he goes, it is good? And here again, I mean, instead of hearing it at a question where we were just giving him information, the Lord allowed me to hear that as a declaration. A declaration coming from the Father saying, it is good. And it was so, so precious. And here again, today, there's times I go, I'd like to go back. I wonder if that person is really there. Or if the Lord just sent him to be there <laughs> while we were there. Did we entertain angels? And I think in many ways we did certainly entertain angels while, while we were there. And so that, that was so precious, you know, to just hear that declaration of saying, you know, it is, is good. And, and it is, and, and here again, just my, my testimony of God's faithfulness, because as I've said before, you know, when we first got there and people here were just starting to know, and as people were starting to pray, I mean, it was miraculous the way, you know, the numbers that they took from doing her blood work in, in the beginning, how within just a short two hours time, the way they were starting to come, come back up, you know. And it wasn't until days later that, that, you know, Dr. Bailey had come and he had said, you know, the severity of shock that Brinley was in, you know, the way her liver and her kidneys were already shutting down, he says, you know, as tiny and fragile as those babies are, he says, you know, we lose those babies. He says, you know, we were astounded at the way her body responded and that, you know, that they were able by the end of that week, you know, to do her open heart surgery, that she was showing them that she was strong enough to undergo a surgery like that. And so there again, you know, as, as the Lord said, you know, Mary, I don't want you to miss my fingerprints. I mean, you know, every, every little thing like that, you know, in those sometimes, you know, it's just point, you know, zero, zero, you know, ones and twos that make such dramatic differences in, in where they were. And, and just to see that, you know, mo moment by moment by moment. And, you know, the song, I need thee every hour, you know, you're in a situation like that. It's like, okay, every second, you know, what's the smallest unit of measure? It's like, you know, you had that, that, you know, how much I need you. And just in every single one of those those areas and and so here again as as situations circumstances as, as trials have come you know I've often asked the why question and here again for me I think the Lord has showed me that for me the why question is a victim question and he goes how about considering these two questions instead and they were the two questions that were asked on the day of Pentecost and we find them in Acts 2 12 and 237 and it says they stood there amazed and perplexed what can this mean they asked each other and then Peter's words pierced their hearts and they said to him and to what the other apostles brothers what should we do so here again two of the ways that the Lord is teaching and training me when a situation a circumstance comes whether it's in my own lives or for those that I'm praying for is to ask those two questions you know, what can this mean? What does this mean? And then, what should we do? And, and I'm just there again. I'm finding that even just starting with those two questions rather than, you know, well, why? Which a lot of times this side of heaven will never be answered. But to say, you know, well, what can this mean? And, and I mean, one, we have an opportunity for growth. There's something that the Lord wants to be for us. There's something that he wants to go in us. He says that the work he began in us, he's faithful to complete us. He's growing us in our Christ-likeness. 
So there's something that he wants to be for us, and there's something that he's wanting to get out of us. So when a situation comes, perhaps you can say, you know, what can this mean? And then what, what should I do? And then I want to go back to um, the, fruit, the fruits of the Spirit in, um, in Galatians. And I talked um, about this in Sukkot because I do believe for 2019 that the fruits of the Spirit, the nine fruits of the Spirit, are something that the Lord does want us to keep in front of us. And I think in asking those questions, what can this mean and what should we do, I think there are aspects of those fruits of the Spirit. You know, is the Father, Father wanting you to have or receive more love, to show more love? Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You know, is there one of those fruits that he's wanting you to grow in? And at Sukkot, I gave you all a piece of paper, and I had you look at the colored to pick it because I said the scripture's all the same. So look at the colors, look at the design, because I, I believe that for you, that was the key that the Father was giving you, saying, you know, this is a starting point. This is a fruit that I want you to consider first as we're heading in to this year. And so as situations come, as trials come, circumstances, whatever it may be, how does that fruit look in that situation? How does the Lord want you to respond? Is it something that needs to be grown in you? Or is it something that, that you've come to a place of there's some maturity there that the Lord, Lord is wanting to use it to flow through you to comfort others as, as you have been, been comforted? Last week in um, lamp lighting, um, Jonathan wrote, read from Isaiah 53. And I mean, Isaiah 53 is just an impactful set of scriptures, impactful set of scriptures anyway. But here again, I just feel like the Lord wanted me to just bring before us to, re to remind us that, you know, he was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. And then when we go down to verses 10 and 11, it says, but it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins." And to me, that's just so, so beautiful that, you know, in our situations, in our circumstances, you know, however hard that they are, you know, he has the answer. He has the answer. It may not come immediately. It may be something that we have to walk out. There may be places where he's asking us to stand for a particular time and just watch what he's going to do. But he is faithful. And so I'm going to end with, you know, evidences of transformation. How do we know that this fruit is growing in my life? Um, we perceive God, ourselves, and our circumstances more like he does. So that's an evidence that we're being transformed and that this fruit is taking root, that it's growing in our lives. 
we think more with the mind of Christ. And we use the same language that God does when he talks about ourselves, when he talks about our situation. And when we choose to respond to others the way God has responded to us. So again, I just stand before you just testifying of God's goodness, of his faithfulness, and how quickly things are going to come together. Um, Sunday morning, I was, was sitting on the couch with, with my husband, and I go, I go, well, I almost woke you up at 3.30 this morning. <laughs> he goes, well, you probably should have. You go, or he goes, I probably was awake, so you could have said whatever. And so I go, I go, well, I go, I was just, I was so excited. I go, I had a dream that Mark and Laura were coming out of the doctor's office and they had a present and they gave it to Brinley and Brinley opened this present and in it was a t-shirt that said Big Sister. And so, you know, I woke up and I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes. We get to be a grandma and grandpa again, you know, so I was, I was so excited, you know, in the middle of the night I did, I, I almost just, you know, called out because I was so excited, but I did, I refrained until a more reasonable hour, <laughs> and then I shared, shared my excitement with them, and so Tuesday when I went down to watch um, Jamie's concert, I was able to feed Brinley Wednesday morning before I returned home, and so she went and she got dressed and when she comes out, she comes walking out like this and she says, Grandma, I'm going to be a big sister. <laughs> and so I just went, oh Lord, you are so good. So here again, evidences of things that the Lord is planting and speaking over us, they're going to come to pass more quickly than we thought. So Mark and Laura are expecting a baby. The end of September, September 25th, is 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 her due date. <laughs> so so we were excited with that. And Mark and Laura were going to tell us this, you know, next next week. But since I was there, she couldn't wait. And then we hurried and we Facetimed Papa so that so that Brinley could tell Papa that that she was going to be a big sister, and, and Mark and Laura go, well, I guess if we want to keep any secrets, we might have to have words with the Lord. <laughs> and you know, Jamie was sitting there, so I was just telling Jamie, I go, okay, so you remember that, Jamie, you can't keep secrets from your mom, Because huh? <laughs> I go, I have an in up there, and he has a way of telling me things. <laughs> And that, so there again, just a testimony of God's goodness, of God's faithfulness. You know, his, his timing is perfect with the things that, that he, he works out. So, so again, we, we just stand in, in, in celebration, and I just wanted to, to share that with, with all of you. So I just say this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.